Thank you very much. Tonight I'll be speaking about Palestine, Israel, and the U.S. Uh, there are many presentations about Israel, some about Palestine, but I feel that there aren't very often ones that really connect all three of those with the United, including the United States. This was scheduled before the latest massacre, so I'll be speaking about my, my book, but I'll also, of course, be talking about the more recent developments to a degree. We receive a great deal of reporting on Israel-Palestine, especially in the last two or three weeks. We've been getting more than usual. Some aspects are covered consistently, frequently, uh, and we know about them. For example, Palestinian rockets. Virtually every report about Gaza or about Israel and about Palestines includes the statement that thousands of rockets have been fired from Gaza into Israel. You know, for months, prob actually for years, we've been hearing about that in almost every report. It's factual, we should know about it, and we do. Uh, a few years ago, the New York Times had a picture of a rocket, it looked very terrifying, terrorists firing it. But given how often they give us that information, thousands of rockets have been fired from Gaza, they tell us very little about those rockets. For example, until quite recently, almost all of them, in fact, probably still, pretty, you know, most of them, are small homemade projectiles. That's what they are. And they, they, in most cases, don't even cause any damage. Now, they give us a statistics of sorts, thousands, but they never tell us, well, how many people have they killed in the whole approximately 12 years they've been used since spring of 2001. Thousands of rockets in total have been fired. How many people have they killed? At least give us a ballpark figure. Well, I did that um, a few months ago, and at that point it was 27 people. Now I think it's up to 29 people. Somehow they just don't tell us that. And they don't tell us as fair-minded people we should and I think do want information about both populations. So during that time, how many Gazans have been killed by Israeli forces? That number is not difficult to find either. Uh, it's about 5,700 Gazans. In fact, actually now it's 6,000, I think, the latest figures. Before the last few weeks, it was 4,700. They just seem to give us some information and leave out other equally significant and relevant information. So we hear about, for example, the Israeli children that have been killed. Every one of those deaths is a tragedy. We learn about the children, we usually see their names, we often hear about their parents. We grieve for those children as we should. But we almost never hear about the Palestinian children. We certainly don't learn their names, we don't see their parents, we don't grieve with their parents for children, we don't even know we're killed. If you'll notice, look at the first year, 91 Palestinian children were killed in the round of violence that began in fall of 2000. 91 were killed before a single Israeli child. And yet our media always portray Israeli actions as retaliatory. Chronologically, that is inaccurate. I think that we should hear about all of those children. And if we had, if we had, if we had known that 91 children were being killed and the number one cause of their deaths was gunfire to the head, if we had known that our money was being used to shoot children in the head, I like to believe, and I do believe, that Americans would have demanded that it stop. And if we had done that, all of those other children might be living today. If we do it now, all of the children in the coming months might be living. I like to tell people how I became involved. I don't happen to be Jewish or Palestinian or Muslim. Like most Americans, uh, about 14 years ago, I, was, I knew very little about Israel-Palestine. 
I was the editor of a very small weekly newspaper in Northern California, writing about the city council, the school district, the local fishing fleet. The Middle East seemed distant, confusing, and irrelevant to my daily life. And so, like most Americans, I skimmed the headlines on this issue, accepted the confusion that I found, and I just moved on. We're very busy, as are all those people outside tonight. But then, in fall of 2000, when what's called the Second Palestinian Intifada began, the Palestinian uprising, and it was in the news a, a bit, I, I decided to pay attention, to just learn what this was all about. And when I finally paid attention so belatedly in my life, I noticed something I should have noticed long before. As a journalist, I noticed how one-sided the coverage was, that we heard from and about Israelis in great detail, as we should. But then I expected and waited to hear about Palestinian in equivalent detail. There are two parties here. But I noticed that came much less frequently. And so I began to look into the issue more and more, I began to read reports from the region and to discover what was going on, and I was shocked at what I discovered. I read in the Israeli media, for example, one of, of many reports, but I read a report uh, reporting what an Israeli academic had said. She said that Israeli forces, as I already by that time had learned, were killing many people, the unarmed demonstrators. They were killing them in large numbers. But she said what the strategy was was to not kill too many. Because if you kill too many, there's the chance you will trigger international outrage. So the deaths were not huge, but the injuries were. Because they were injuring large numbers, those would be off the radar. She wrote that they were injuring, I think they had injured 6,000 in the first month. And she wrote, and please remember, this is from an Israeli newspaper that I read this. She wrote that Israeli forces were specifically targeting eyes and kneecaps. So with that kind of information, as well as learning for the first time in my life that we give Israel more of our tax money than any other country on earth, more than all of sub-Saharan Africa put together, that it is approximately $8 million per day now it's, it's about to go up to about $10 million per day. I, be, I, I began to think this was the most covered up issue I had ever seen of such profound importance. And so I decided I needed to go and see for myself if what I thought I was beginning to learn was actually true. And so began the most unusual trip I've ever t undertaken. Many years before I had been in the Peace Corps in Afghanistan. In that case, I had a very official support system helping me and guiding me the Peace Corps. In this case, I was going to be traveling alone, and I had no organization sponsoring or guiding me whatsoever. As I landed on February 7th at 8 p.m. 2001, I experienced a sudden pang of the disquiet I'd been trying to ignore on that very long airline flight. What was it going to be like for me? as a single female American to wander alone through a Muslim, largely Muslim land that was in the middle of a violent uprising. And that was at the epicenter, we're continually told, is hostile to Americans in general and to women in particular. What was it going to be like for me? As I traveled very randomly and haphazardly, I discovered these were more two myths about this area that are as widely believed as they are false. People invited me to stay in their homes, which I gladly did. They uh, treated me with respect. Whenever I said I was an American, which is what I, I always told them, uh, the invariable response on that trip and on my many trips since was welcome. And yet we almost never see this. On that trip, I'll just tell you a, a little bit about it, but I found more about what was being done to Palestinians. Remember, this was this was, by this time, February of 2001. Before a single rocket had be f been fired, about five years before Hamas had been elected. Those are the two reasons, supposedly, Israel's is attacking Gaza. Well, this is what Gaza looked like. These are the pictures I took. Here it is. That was filled with families. 
This is the Tufa area of Khan Yunus in southern Gaza. The people who were lucky had abandoned their homes. They were the people who had somewhere else to go. They'd only lost their home that sheltered them in old age, where their children were once safe. They had somewhere else to go, but many people were still living in those homes. These, these are all gone now. At one point when I was wandering around this area, there was suddenly Israeli gunfire very nearby. We all ducked and they took me away to a safer area. As I wrote in, a, in an email at the time, I at first that Israel, thought that Israeli gunfire that suddenly occurred uh, was just a coincidence. But then as I thought about it more, I think that was a very naive assessment. Because I had occasionally looked over sandbag barricades or peeked over, peeked out shuttered windows, and I had seen Israeli guard towers overlooking us. And I have no doubt that those Israeli soldiers noticed that a foreigner was wandering around, and I suspect they decided to send her a message. Don't see what we're doing. Don't come to Palestine. I saw beautiful agricultural lands that were being destroyed next to the beautiful blue Mediterranean Sea. I saw a stand of what had been 100-year-old date palms that were flattened. I saw groves of, of olive trees destroyed, entire crops destroyed, and I remembered thinking, I, I saw farmers who had farmed there forever, for generation upon generation had farmed there. And I thought, how are they going to feed their children? You know, when your entire orchard is destroyed, your entire farm, your, all, of, all of your crops, how do you feed your children? And this was many years ago before it got really bad. I saw a people and a land being destroyed with my news money, with my, my tax money. To me, that's newsworthy. I think as Americans, sometimes we're, we're sort of used to seeing images of third world poverty. I think we're troubled by them, but we tend to think, well, there's so much, what can I do? But that's not what I was seeing. I was seeing intentionally created poverty through the use of American money. And I saw much more. I don't like seeing suffering. I don't like seeing children in pain. But since even by that time, Thousands of children had been injured through the use of my tax money. It was my job to see them. And all I had to do, it turned out, was go to the nearest hospital. And I saw children with bullets in their back, often in their back because they were running away, and in their stomach and in their heads. I saw a brain-dead 12-year-old. I saw children who will never walk again. They won't skip, they won't frolic. Their childhoods are finished. At one point I saw a, 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 a child, I saw his parents, and they asked if I could help them. They were happy to see me as an American because they thought maybe I could help their poor son. So at, I asked the doctor if maybe I could do something. Maybe a surgical team could be flown in from the US or maybe their son could be flown back to the United States. Sometimes that's possible. And the doctor explained to me that he hadn't yet had the right, found the right time and the right way to tell the parents, but that their son was totally and eternally paralyzed. So I knew something they didn't know, and I wished that I didn't, and now you do too. That's what I saw in Gaza, and then I went to the West Bank to a newspaper office, and when I first arrived there, they said a nine-year-old boy was just shot and maybe, maybe you'd like to go see. And I thought, no, I wouldn't like to go see. But I did. I was there for all of us, and I took pictures. I saw where he had been sitting watching, watching his father paint the walls. I saw the wet paint, the toy trucks, the blood on the floor. I saw the wall hanging that had a, a bullet hole in it. And I was told that that says, thinking of God makes our hearts grow calm. I saw the needle point over the front door that I could read myself. It said, God bless our home. The family had moved in 10 days before to their dream house. I saw the flowers in the living room and the family photos on the wall. And I saw the parents when they got back from the hospital. I heard the mother and the sisters weeping 
and weeping. And I saw the father walking around shell-shocked. It looked like he was sleepwalking in a bad dream that will never end. And I saw the, the neighbors come in to try to comfort them. At one point I heard a man tell the father when it looked like he was about to break down, your son is a bird in heaven now. The next day was the funeral, and the next day there was another. They were funerals pretty much every day. And for the, the second one was for a woman who had had three sons, 18, 14, and 12. And she had been killed. So as I was interviewing people, I suddenly found myself next to a woman who it turned out was the dead woman's neighbor. This woman had gone to college in the US. She told me about her friend. She said that just a few days before, her friend had been asking her what it was like to go to college in the US because her 18-year-old son wanted to go to college in the US. This woman explained to me, she said, it's every boy's dream in Palestine to go to college in the US. But she said, of course he won't go now. He'll stay home to help with his brothers. And since that trip, I've been back other times and seen the wall confiscating more land and the Kafkaesque way that people get out of Bethlehem if they can get out of Bethlehem. And this is, these are my pictures from the last time I visited Gaza in around 2010. And when I came back from that first trip, I started an organization called If Americans Knew because I believed, and I still believe, if we all knew what was going on, we would stop funding it, and we would end the violence. We especially looked at the media, because the media, I feel, n news organizations, this is the most powerful institution in a democracy. This is how everybody around us learns what they think they know about many issues, especially international issues. So we, we decided to conduct media studies. I like the idea of a statistical study where you choose a category of significance, something as, that is as immune to subjective bias as possible. We decided to study how the media covered deaths among both populations. Both is the key word. We rarely get that. And we especially decided to look at the first year of that current uprising because first impressions are so powerful. And we did a subcategory of how many children were killed and how those were covered. Because I believe pretty much all of us feel that it is horrible and tragic when a child is killed. We're deeply saddened. It's also extremely newsworthy. So we needed to ask, to answer a very sad question, how many children among both populations were killed in that first year? Using an Israeli source, we discovered 28 Israeli children had been killed and 131 Palestinian children. How was this covered by our prime time network news shows, CBS, ABC, NBC? Well, we found that they had covered Israeli children's deaths at rates up to 13 and 14 times greater than they reported on the Palestinian children's deaths. In fact, typically, uh, the, the media have a pattern of reporting on Palestinian children's deaths so minimally, even though they are so large, that many people have no idea they've been occurring. Another group did a study of national public radio. Uh, NPR has been accused consistently by Israel partisans as being supposedly pro-Palestinian. They have caused sub substantial financial damage to some NPR affiliates around the country with that accusation. So fairness and accuracy in reporting decided to look into those accusations and to study NPR's reporting. Their researcher, Seth Ackerman, did an excellent study, and he discovered that, yes, indeed, NPR is very distorted on this issue, but that, once again, it is in a pro-Israel direction. He gave his study what I feel is a brilliant title, he called it the illusion of balance. Because NPR, he, he counted up, had covered almost the same number of Israeli children's deaths as Palestinian children's deaths, making it seem to many listeners this was a reliable, unbiased source of information. 
balanced information. In reality, that was not balanced. That was huge distortion. In fact, I would suggest it was manipulation, in which you report a very large proportion, almost all, of one, portion's, one population's deaths and very few of the others. Uh, we've also looked at daily newspapers. Just, this is just a very typical daily newspaper from Silicon Valley, near Stanford University, the San Jose Mercury News. In this case, we looked at front page headlines. Uh, many people are so busy, that might be all you'll look at for that day, but at least you're keeping up with the important news of the day, the big front page news of the day. And again, to study those, we needed to baseline how many people of both population were killed. We discovered that, as always, it, in, in every period of time, it's far more Palestinians that had been killed during that period. 121 Israelis, at least 384 Palestinians. How is this covered by, by this daily newspapers, daily re, uh, front page headlines? They had reversed it and increased the differential. So while this is what was actually going on, that's what it looked like. I was astounded. This was one of our first studies. And it occurred to me, what if the Mercury News had covered the Super Bowl backwards? What if they'd gotten the World Series wrong? There would have been jokes about them by late night comedians around the country. And yet here they were committing a distortion of that magnitude, having to do with lives and deaths, and no one noticed it. And I would suggest that the newspapers here did the same thing. Often, throughout the past 12 or 13 years, I have seen this phrase, as perhaps many of you have noticed, that whenever, is, almost any time Israelis suffer something, are killed or there's an attack, a successful attack on Israel, um, it's portrayed as a period of calm, has just been shattered by Palestinian violence. There was a headline of that sort in 2005 in the Los Angeles Times. I was living in LA at that time, and I saw this headline and this news story on their website bef in, in early evening, long before the newspaper had gone to press. So I tried to call the foreign desk with a correction so that they wouldn't publish something that was wrong. And I told them that during what they were calling a period of calm, 170 Palestinian men, women, and children had been killed. And that during a period they said was calm, 379 Palestinian men, women, and children had been injured. Their response was, we said relative calm. And they hung up the phone. And they didn't change a single word in their news story or add a single piece of this information. There are so many omissions that I could go on all night with these, but I'll do just one more. This is a very different one. This one is about the US. This one is about something that took place on Capitol Hill in 2003. There was a briefing in the Rayburn House office building. The chairman of that briefing was a four-star admiral, Admiral Thomas Moore. He had been chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a World War II hero, the highest rank a military officer can attain, really, and former chairman of chiefs, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff. Also part of the panel was a rear admiral, Merlin Starring, who had been in charge of the whole legal department of the US Navy. Also part of their commission was a Marine general. And not just any Marine general, this one was the highest ranking Medal of Honor recipient in the United States. The highest medal of valor an American can win. They announced their findings on Capitol Hill that Israel had tried to set a sink a US Navy ship, that they had killed 34 Americans and injured over 170 of them. The decks had been running with blood that rescue flights to these men had been recalled by order of the Secretary of Defense and the President of the United States. That this incident, in fact, had been ordered covered up by the President of the United States, and that this attack by Israel constituted an act of war against the United States by Israel. 
Statements of that gravity by officials of that high rank on Capitol Hill in a House office building are newsworthy. And yet, there was nothing about them in the Washington Post, the New York Times, the allegedly patriotic network, Fox News, we may wish to call why they didn't cover it. The only place that covered those statements was the Stars and Stripes newspaper. That's the military newspaper abroad. And it's in detail in the congressional record. There you can read every word. Now let's talk about the, the recent situation. I'm not up with the most recent since I've been out of touch for a few hours. But let's look at what has gone on in the recent conflicts, beginning, I, I'd say, over, over about the last five or six years. In 2009 to 10, there was a similar bombardment of, of Gaza in which at least 1,400 Palestinians were killed, a large majority of them civilians. In fact, over half, I believe, were women and children and nine Israelis were killed. Then in 2012, we had a much smaller massacre in which this number actually was turned out to be larger because a number of people died later from their injuries, but it was at least 169 Palestinians of whom quite a few were children compared to six Israelis. And now we come to 2014 in which the media date, the, the progression that has led to the current ma massacre, they, they usually start it from about, I believe, uh, June 12th, when three young Israelis were abducted and tragically murdered. That's where they usually start it from. Well, let's, let's be a little more honest and start it from a more reasonable starting point. Let's start with January 1st and look at the deaths among both populations again, because all matter. And you will see the Israeli deaths on the left and the Palestinian deaths on the right. So here is January. The pink is a child, no Israeli deaths. Next we will look at February, no Israeli deaths. Next we will look at May, um, a ch the green one is a child. Next we will look at April, we do have one Israeli, a soldier. And next we have May, three more Palestinians, two of them children. None of this was newsworthy to our media. None of those children, none of that was newsworthy. And uh, what about abductions? They were very concerned about three Israelis abducted. Well, during this time, January 1st through May 31st, Israeli forces had abducted 2,300 Palestinians quite a few children among them, but that wasn't newsworthy. Now we look at June, and there we see those three. And then we look at up, then we have the chart, this one that I have here, up through July 21st, I think it was. And those are the numbers. This is what we're not getting. We get such filtered coverage with so many omissions of a, of a, of one sort. When I began to look into this and wake up to this late in my life, I wondered much more. How did this all begin? What's going on? How, what's, what's Israel Palestine about? Who really did initiate the violence? You know, we've seen from January 1st, we've seen going back to um, the January, uh, going back to 2000, 2001. Where, where and how did this all start? And how did the U.S. get such a uniquely special relationship with a tiny country without resources? How did this happen? Well, one of the first things I learned was that when, when I was born, there was no Israel. So where did this come from? Well, what I discovered was that there was a movement uh, that began over a century ago and began operating in Europe and in the United States. It was, a, was and is a political movement that has profoundly and negatively impacted our country. It has tragically impacted the Middle East and it has dangerously impacted the entire world. And yet most of us, I think, 
have never heard of it and could certainly not define it. It's political Zionism. This was a movement to create a Jewish state in Palestine. It began in the late 1800s. Well, let us look at Palestine in the late 1800s. It was what we largely think of now as a somewhat multicultural land in that it was about 80% Muslim, about 15% Christian, and about 5% Jewish, all living together quite successfully. There are mosques, synagogues, uh, churches throughout Palestine, throughout the Middle East, and throughout North Africa. These populations had been living without conflict for centuries. But with this movement was, was created largely in Israel, uh, largely in Europe, and then taken up at the same time in the US, to create a Jewish state on land that was already inhabited, in which 95% were not Jewish. Therefore, this would involve, and this was known by the leadership, even though many followers didn't know it, this would mean that 95% of those people were going to be dispossessed by money, if possible, by force, if necessary. This was written in, in Zionist journals early on. Now, my book and my talk concentrates on the US aspect of all of this. What surprised me in my research is how early and how active this movement was in the United States, a movement I'd never heard of, although I was born here, and my parents were born here, and some ancestors go back to the beginning. It turns out that this was a very significant movement long before my parents were born. And then by 1910, there were already 20,000 Zionists in the US. They included lawyers, professors, and businessmen. It was already in 1910 a movement to which congressmen listened. Then in 1912, we had a very significant development. A prominent lawyer named Louis Brandeis became a Zionist. Brandeis not only just be, didn't just become a Zionist, within about two years, he then became the head of world Zionism. This was, a pub, this was public, it's not some secret knowledge, it's just that most of us don't know it. And then within a few years, he was also a Supreme Court Justice, named by Woodrow Wilson. When you're a Supreme Court Justice, you're supposed to resign your various board memberships and affiliations because you're supposed to not have any conflict of interest but be neutral. So he did resign his leadership of world Zionism, but in reality, he continued it. He would receive reports in his Supreme Court chambers by his loyal lieutenants, and then he would give them directives to go out and to uh, follow in work for Zionism. And this is mentioned in a number of very reliable books. If you get my book, you'll see that my book is over half footnotes. It's all cited. By the way, one of his loyal lieutenants also went on to become a very prominent Supreme Court Justice, Felix Frankfurter. So I'd read that. That, to me, was shocking right there. But then I discovered something more. So I'll give you my citations for this next information so you can evaluate whether you find it reliable or not. I, the way I did my research is I, I would read books, then I would look at their footnotes to see where they had gotten that information. Then I would often get those books and read those footnotes and then order those books and read those footnotes and on and on. So one of the books that I read was re really a fairly uh, well-known one. Israel in the Mind of America, published by a very mainstream establishment publisher, and the author was a very mainstream uh, author. He had been diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times, he had been at Harvard, he'd written a number of well-regarded, very establishment nonfiction books. Well, in this book, he had a few pages in which he told about a secret Zionist society that had operated in the United States of which Louis Brandeis, while a Supreme Court Justice, had been a leader. So I looked at where he got that information, and I went to that source. It turned out to be from a scholarly journal called the American Jewish Historical Quarterly, a very respected 
journal. So then I looked at the author. Well, is this a reliable author who wrote this very, to me, explosive information and turned out to be a, a well-regarded Israeli historian at a, a mainstream uh, Israeli university. She had written an article in 1975 called The Parashim, a secret episode in American Zionist history. Uh, and she told about what this was, an elitist secret society. The word meant Pharisees and separate. They would go around the country and influence people to push the Zionist agenda. By the way, at this time, the Jewish population were not the Zionists at all. The large majority were not Zionists. Many were opposed to Zionism. This was a, a very, very fringe uh, element to a certain regard. Then in this secret society, they even had a secret induction ceremony so that when somebody joined this society, and many, their membership included professors and Harvard, you know, recent Harvard graduates and uh, doctors, significant people around the country were sometimes members. And in the initiation ceremony, they were told by the inductor, and they swore to this, until our purpose shall be accomplished, you will be the fellow of a brotherhood whose bond you will regard as greater than any other in your life dearer than that of family, of school, of nation. As early as November 1915, a leader of the Parashim went around suggesting that the British might gain some benefit from a formal declaration in support of a Jewish national homeland in Palestine. Those of you who have heard of the Balfour Declaration that came in 1917 might find this relevant. I'll get into that a little bit more. Let's remember what was going on during this time period now in the world, especially that involved Britain. Well, of course, in 1914 began what was called at that time the Great War of massive carnage. British forces in the first day of the Battle of the Somme lost, according to historians, somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 men in one day of a battle that went on and on and on. The British and the German, both sides of course, wanted the US to come in on their side to join this carnage. But the American population were that bad thing, they were isolationists. They didn't want to go kill and be killed in a foreign pointless war. In fact, Woodrow Wilson was elected with the slogan, he kept us out of the war. But of course, as you know, with hindsight, no, he didn't. Well, what happened is that the, the Zionists leaders, some of them in Britain, a man named Chaim Weizmann, who is quite well known, went to the British government and said, well, we can help you win this war. Now, why would they want to do that? Because the war wasn't just against Germany, it was against the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire uh, held Palestine. Palestine was under, under the Ottoman Empire. So by defeating them, the British would, would come into control of, of Palestine. So the Zionists went to the British and said, we can help you get the United States into the war. Our, our Zionist colleagues in the United States for example, they said in writing, Louis Brandeis, who is close to President Wilson, can help to do that. In exchange for that, the British did issue a declaration that was quite significant, mild as it may sound. It was really considered a gentleman's agreement. This is written about in a number of books. Just most of us don't know this about our own history. So the Balfour Declaration was basically a promise that the British would help to facilitate the Zionist objective of creating a Jewish state in Palestine. After the British, of course, did win, then at the Paris peace talks, the Zionists pushed to uh, push this wording into the mandate in which Britain took charge of... <laughs> then jumping ahead to some of the American aspects again, then we find during the 30s and the 40s, in Palestine itself, there were some, the violence 
increased. Naturally, as soon, you know, when there was colonization beginning around the turn of the century to a land with the intention of pushing out the land, the indigenous population at some point is going to wake, out, wake up and there will be violence. That has happened in the early 20s and again in 1929. There was violence between the two populations. Then, uh, then as now, the large number of those killed were the Palestinians. So as the violence increased, there were some terrorist organizations created in Palestine by the Zionists. One of them led by a former, in fact, two of them led by future Israeli prime ministers. And uh, those, those terrorist organizations in Palestine, the Irgun and the Stern Gang, it turns out had front groups in the United States with duplicitous names. And they were funneling massive amounts of money and weaponry to these terror groups in Palestine. They put on major pageants where Supreme Court justices attended and thousands of people attended. They were very prominent. One of them was led by a, a man named Peter Bergson, people thought. His real name was Hillel Cook. He was the operative for the Irgun. I looked into one of the leaders a bit more, just, just because I needed to find out his first name. When you're writing a book, you can't just write someone's last name, you need to know their first name. And I had heard about another leader of, of one of these types of front groups connected to killing in Palestine. And uh, his name was Rabbi Korf, but I didn't know the first name. None of the books that I had had a few paragraphs of them, but none of them gave his first name. So I looked into it on the internet, tried to do various searches, and eventually I came up with a UN report that gave his, his first name, Baruch Korf, and told a little bit about a plot he was part of. Using those search terms, I then could just, you know, put in more information into my search bar, and suddenly all these PDFs of American newspapers popped up, all of these returns. It turned out that Rabbi Baruch Korf was part of a, a, a cell in Paris that was planning to fly an airplane and bomb Britain after the war. Britain that had just defeated Hitler. But they were so angry at the British because the British were not allowing a, a large enough Jewish immigration into Palestine. So they were going to kill the British. So Baruch Korf and his section of the Stern Gang had this plan, but there was one problem. They, they didn't know how to fly an airplane. They weren't pilots. So they needed to find somebody, and they recruited a young American aviator named Reginald Gilbert, I discovered. Reginald Gilbert had been an ace during the war. He was in Paris, and they recruited him to fly the airplane for them. He pretended to go along with the plot, but then he went to the American embassy. And the American embassy ins informed the Paris police and Scotland Yard. So for a week, he pretended to go along with this cell. And then when it came time to actually take off, to fly the plane, to drop these uh, incendiary bombs onto the foreign ministry, they were caught. By the way, the original plan had been to bomb parliament but then they decided they hated the foreign ministry more. And Gilbert at one point had said to them, well, what if I can't find the foreign ministry in, in the London fog? They didn't have this you know, degree of instrumentation we have today, and that was a real possibility. And they said, then just drop them anywhere. Kill anybody. All, of, all British are our enemy. So they were caught. Korf was in prison for a few months in Paris, and he eventually got off. He had very powerful friends in the United States. But I was curious about him. I looked into him some more. To, you know, this was so astounding to me, and none of these you know, dozens and dozens of books I have, none of them had, any, had this story in there at all. And so in looking at him, I discovered that later in life, he was a friend of Richard Nixon. In fact, it was reported that he had helped to influence Nixon's policies on the Middle East. In fact, Nixon sort of in a fond way called him my rabbi. Now the precursor to today's very powerful Israel lobby was a group called the American Zionist Emergency Council, AZEC. 
Uh, this was formed in around 1940, and by 1943 had a budget of half a million dollars at a time when a nickel bought a loaf of bread. Within a few years, they had maneuvered their way into access to an even far larger sum in which they had access to $14 million in 1941 and $150 million by 1948. That's the equivalent in today's dollars of a trillion dollars to use to manipulate the United States. So they targeted with that money every sector of US society. Uh, and, you know, this isn't ancient history. They had annual reports, they had directives, you know, all of this was written down on paper. They targeted congressmen, Christian clergy, editors, professors, business and labor, Jewish war veterans. They published uh, books all over. They had 400 local committees. There were massive campaigns throughout the country. They also worked especially to manufacture Christian support. They s uh, secretly funded sort of Christian groups that would push the same Zionist ideology. They uh, funded books that became huge bestsellers. It was a, an em enormously successful campaign throughout the country. Even though during this time there was a great deal of opposition to Zionism by many different groups, by Christian leaders, by State Department, Pentagon, intelligence agencies, Jewish anti-Zionists, Many people were opposed to it. Two of the most celebrated Christian pastors opposed it on religious and moral grounds. Uh, the Christian leaders in the Middle East had gone to the Paris Peace Talks to advocate on behalf of the Arab population that there should be self-determination of peoples there. Uh, one very prominent American Christian who was a Dead Sea scholar wrote a wonderful book called Palestine is Our Issue, Is Our Business. And, you know, to read that book, you, it's very strong. It talks about the right of return, about Palestinian resistance fighters, etc. But it was buried. Diplomats, the State Department, the military, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies wrote directive after directive, study after study, memo after memo, talking about how damaging to the U.S and to U.S. strategic interests, and how in violation of American principles, Zionism would be. Starting from under Taft, there was then a commission to, the, to Palestine during the time of the Paris peace talks. They went there to investigate the situation, to you know, look into the possibility of creating a Jewish state there. And they came back with a very powerful report saying this would be a grave trespass on the rights of the people there. This was entirely buried and uh, had no effect whatsoever. Dean Acheson, a major statesman for many years, wrote that the Zionist agenda would imperil not only American but all Western interests in the Near East. The CIA wrote that they were pursuing objectives that would endanger the strategic interests of the Western powers in the Near and Middle East. There, there's so much evidence of, of this. You know, some people debate about whether the lobby is powerful. It's been powerful since the beginning. And the evidence is all there. It's just buried. Alfred Lilienthal was part of the American Council for Judaism. I had the honor of meeting him. He wrote excellent books about this. That group was, was arguing against Zionism. And part of what they were arguing in the State Department was that there would be massive bloodshed and chaos if this was pushed through. When the Zionists began to work to push through what's called the partition plan through the United Nations, that's portrayed to Americans as this wonderful compromise. Palestinians just, you know, ignored this wonderful opportunity that Palestinians pushed through. Well, they, they knew, and the State Department were saying this would be a, a disaster if this gets pushed through. The idea was that, the, that Palestine half of it would be given to a Jewish state. Even though these were mo mostly recently arrived and had originally only been 5% five of, the, of, the five of the population. And even after decades of immigration, were 30% of the population. And this plan wasn't actually half. The plan was that they would get 55% of Palestine, approximately, and the Palestinians would get about 45% of their own land. Now, I know what the Americans would say if the UN did that to us, 
But this is portrayed with, oh, those foolish Palestinians not accepting that. Um, and by the way, the, many people are under the illusion that Israel bought up all that land. That's what's been told, and that was the attempt. And they did increase Jewish ownership about over, you know, from what was originally about 1% because it was so an urban population to at most 8%. Most historians said they owned about 5 to 6%. So a group that owned 8% under this plan was getting 55%, a good deal for them. No wonder they said they would go along with it and secretly in their journal said it's the first step, then we will get it all. But rather than bringing peace, which was what the UN was charged with, instead of bringing peace, it did the opposite. It created, of course, still more violence. And there was a war that Israel calls its War of Independence, and Palestinians call it Al-Nakba, the catastrophe, because it was a massive humanitarian catastrophe. At least three quarters of a million men, women, and children were very ruthlessly and violently pushed off their land. There were at least 16 massacres before a single Arab army finally joined the fray. And by the way, those of you that grew up with the myth that I did, that little Israel declared its independence and suddenly, you know, five to seven Arab armies suddenly just attacked, but Israel somehow won because God, you know, was on their side or something. Well, in reality, before Israel declared its independence on about May 14th, 15th, it's a midnight type of situation. They had already committed 16 massacres. These are quite grisly. You can read the details of them. They had already ethnically cleansed at least 200,000 people. When these Arab armies did come into the fray, they were smaller in number, including the Palestinian forces, than, than the Zionist forces were. And by the way, all, all, virtually all of the battles were actually fought on the part that, according to the UN plan, was going to be Palestinian territory. Now, some people, again, were trying to tell Americans what was going on. One of the most important was a woman named Dorothy Thompson. She was what Britannica Encyclopedia says was one of the most famous journalists of the 20th century. In fact, I believe at one place they say that she is the most important female journalist of the 20th century. It's true, although I had never heard of her. She had a newspaper column that was printed all over the United States, a radio program that was listened to by millions of Americans. She was such a celebrity that there was a Broadway play in which she was, loose, she was played by Lauren Bacall, and there was a Hollywood movie loosely based on her life in which she was played by Katherine Hepburn. She was considered the most powerful woman in the United States after Eleanor Roosevelt. She was an excellent journalist. She had been a foreign correspondent in Germany during the 30s and had been one of the first journalists to raise the alarm about Hitler. She was the first foreign journalist to be expelled by Hitler. She was therefore very sympathetic to Zionism. But after the war, when Israel, when, you know, later when Israel began to be created, she went over to see this wonderful state of Israel, the new Jewish state. And when she got there, she saw hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees living in squalor, dying in large numbers every day. And she began to write of them, to tell about them, to speak about them. She even eventually made a documentary about them. And for telling about these people, for writing about these people, she lost her newspaper column, she lost her radio program, she lost her fame, and she was erased from history. On sort of a similar final note, if I now tried to write an article, maybe about Dorothy Thompson, a fascinating person, or maybe about the Parashim, or maybe about Reginald Gilbert, there's much more I could tell you about, very interesting about him. If I tried to do that, for a popular American history magazine, which I would like to do, I quite likely would not get it published. And that's, you know, this is not paranoid s speculation. A few years ago, we tried to put a paid newspaper ad in American history magazine, not about Palestine. We tried to put a paid ad in about a book, a memoir by a 91-year-old American congressman. It tells about his, his uh, childhood and depression era America. 
in Corn Belt America, about being a small town newspaper editor, about serving the Seabees during World War II, about going to Congress, about all his various fights in Congress, and about also, near the end of the book, it tells about the fact that when he started to speak about Palestine, he was targeted by the Israel lobby, money was funded to his opponent, and after 22 years in Congress, he lost the election, Paul Finley. But our advertisement didn't even tell about that last part of his very long life. It just told about his book, you know, with the usual blurbs about what a wonderful book this is. But Eric Weider, the publisher and owner of American History Magazine, informed us that they would not publish our advertisement in American History Magazine because we were anti-Israel, and that they would not publish our advertisement in any of the popular history magazines that they own in the United States, which is virtually every one. This is, according to their website, the largest history chain in the world, and it's certainly the largest one in the United States. So what do we do about this? To me, we tell people what's going on. We even talk to those people that we don't want to raise something serious or uncomfortable with, because right now, as we're talking, we all know what's going on in Gaza in general. We don't know which child was just killed or lost their parents. We don't know which home was just destroyed, which hospital was further destroyed, but we know what's going on right now. And now we, we know a little bit about what's going on here. But we have the power to change this. I feel strongly that if every single person in the United States right now that is concerned about Gaza would actually just do something like maybe again, or maybe for the first time, phone your senator. If every single one of us did that tomorrow, it wouldn't change the policy overnight, but they would have, they have their fingers to the wind, and suddenly they would realize, whoa, looks like the tide is changing here. And half of them would love it to change. They don't like being APAC puppets. Now some of them, are ideological Zionists, you know, that, that's the reality. But according to a congressman that I talked to a number, few years ago, he said over half in Congress know what they are doing is wrong, but the Israel they're afraid of the Israel lobby. In other cases, Congress people have privately told individuals, you need to make me do this, you need to create the grassroots movement so that I can do it. If everyone in America did that, it would begin the impact that would bring change. Thank you very much.